This is White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Our vision is to provide a place for hurting, broken people to find love, forgiveness, and encouragement. A place to help develop people to spiritual maturity through Bible study, training courses, and small group ministries. A place to help every believer discover their God-given gifts, talents, and callings. It's our desire to strengthen families, and to be a blessing to all who come our way. And now, White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Come on. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life how many you know the Holy Spirit gives us life in Genesis it talks about God the Creator breathing the breath of life into man and you know what that Holy Spirit is our life how many say he's our life and you know wherever the Holy Spirit is he doesn't dwell in a dead place 
If you're a born again believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And some of you just need to let him out. Let him blow all over you. Amen. Don't keep him cooped up in you. Let him spill out all over your life. It's the Holy Spirit. And, and he is the life and the breath of us. And we celebrate today. God has given us our being. The psalmist said, I will praise you, O Lord, in the land of the living. Yes. You give life. You give breath. Come on. You give life. You are love. Come on. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. Yes. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. Come on. And great. One. You give life. Come on, everybody. You give life. Yes. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great on you, Lord. Come on. Great.
Turn me around, how he plays my 
a reality as well the apostle paul was writing in second thessalonians chapter 2 he said now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our lord jesus christ he was addressing false prophets and things that were happening they were getting confused about when the lord jesus was going to return and a fervor had had been up you know paul left that first uh, uh first letter to the thessalonians where he talked about the rapture of the church and people were getting all worked up and, and they said it's going to be today or and, and and there were people that was going in their wolves sowing discord and stuff and telling different things and, and, and the Gnostics and different things like that. And he, said, he said that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by the Spirit nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Here's verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come the return of Christ except there come a falling away first. That word is in the Greek is the word apostasia. It is a word that literally means to fall away. It means a departure, a departure from the faith. Now the reality is this, is yes, I believe in the Lord for revival and I'm going to speak it. But there is another reality, it's a parallel and you've heard pastor talk about a parallel of extremes, you know what I mean, like a train track. You've got one side that a revival, could a revival coexist with a falling away? Yes. Absolutely it could. But we can't just say, well, let's pray for revival, and we should pray for revival, but not neglect to understand that we're living in biblical times. We're living at a time as on the eve of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a falling away. How do I know there's a falling away? Because I've lived through 2020 and 2021 and 2022. The past three years have been hell on earth. And it's from hell. Hell, it's divided the body of Christ. People have been picked off. There's been people that started and said, you know, the, ch the church is shut down for a period. And you go, you know, hindsight's always 2020, all right? And you look back and you see how the enemy worked. Now, you're here today. I'm thankful. Thankful you're here. 
But there has been a falling away. I've seen people even in church that I know that were red hot on fire for God. And now I don't know where they are. I hope they still are. I don't know. I'm not the judge. But we see a falling away coming. And here's what I've come to do today. In James chapter 5, here's what it says in verse 19. And this is what I've come to the Lord. I believe the Holy Spirit has given me this today to speak to you. And it's not a shouting, stomping message, but I think it's a solemn word that I think is for us today as we prepare to receive from God. How many want to receive from God? James wrote this. He said, brethren, that's the same word for believers, brothers and sisters, okay? Believers, the church. If any of you, if any of you, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know. That which he converts the sinner, sinner? Talk to the church? From the error of his way. And he shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. I want to speak to you a few moments on what are you becoming? What are you becoming? This is a message to the church today. And it can be a message to somebody that has never known Jesus but what are you becoming? What are you becoming? Lord, we just come to you right now. I pray that you would anoint us, Lord. Lord, anoint me, Jesus, I pray. And I pray that you would anoint every ear to hear that's in this room. And Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, we would all be conformed to your image. We're called to be that. Pastor Roger is not the measuring stick. Our favorite evangelist isn't. Our favorite brother or sister in Christ isn't. You are Jesus. And Lord, we want to be like you today. We want to become more and more and more like you. So Lord, help me for the next few moments just to relay this simple message today. And I pray, Lord, that it would encourage. I pray, Lord, that it might challenge us to think and to receive this word with gladness. And know today is a day that we can, we can make a change today. By your grace, because your grace is here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. Luke chapter 6. Do you have Luke chapter 6 there? All right, let's look in verse 12. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Now, this is Jesus here. You ready? In these days, he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve. Who chose them? Christ, Jesus, whom he named apostles. Here we go. Here's the list. Simon, and I'm reading out of the ESV, okay? Simon, who he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Pay particular attention to this last one. Who's this last guy? Judas is probably one of the more famous or infamous disciples. And here's what he said. And Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. It is insightful to me that when Luke listed the 12 apostles, as he just did, when he came to Judas Iscariot, he identified him as the apostle who became a traitor. He became this. Let me start with a sincere question for me, for you, for all of us. It's the most important question that we can ask ourselves is this. You. What are you becoming what are you becoming you know the christian walk is not one where we stand on the bench sit on a bench or sit on a pew <laughs> and we just let the years roll by you know a lot of people you know religion tells you to do this it's got a prescription uh, of different religions different denominations different things we'll sprinkle you as a baby some uh, uh or some say we you need to be baptized others will say, you know, of course, you need to come forward and join the church or, or uh, confess to a priest, some would say. 
And all of that stuff is fine and dandy. But what religion says, now you do that and you go back and sit down and you just be a nice Christian and wait. But the reality is our walk is not based on religion, it's relationship. If you had a relationship with someone and you never talked to them since 1978, do you really have a relationship with them? You don't. But see, that's how a lot of people treat their relationship with God. Oh, but I go to his church on Sundays. That's awesome. Thank you. We're glad you're here. But it's not just about here. We're here, come here to worship God. This isn't the litmus test for Christianity. This is the expectation. Hebrews chapter 9 says that it's a New Testament commandment, by the way. You know, a lot of people don't want to say, don't like it, but it's true. It's a New Testament commandment. There are, how many of you know there are commandments in the New Testament? Did you know that there's actually more commandments in the New Testament than there are in the Old Testament? Eef. It's like over a thousand some. It's only, what, 613 in the Old but it says, don't forsake yourselves, assembling of yourselves together, for such is the day. It's coming. That day is coming. It's approaching. We simply see, as we just read, that there's a falling away. There's a departure. There's people that become disillusioned. Even the Apostle Paul talked about that your faith can be what? Shipwrecked. You've heard pastors preach on that many a time. But our walk with God is not a, a sit down and just... Bide our time. Now, that's easy. I mean, it, it's kind of nice to think of it that way sometimes because it's relaxing because it's nothing that affects you and you're here and it kind of maybe gives you some little bit of hope and peace. And, but either the reality is to have an active relationship with someone, either we're getting closer to them or we're moving away from them. Jesus told his disciples, it's interesting that he said, come what? Follow me. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm going to be moving. I'm not going to do something that is convenient for you. I'm not going to just have service at Capernaum here every Sabbath. And you just sit down here. He said, I'm going all over the Holy Land. <laughs> I'm going to be preaching everywhere. And, 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 and I need you to follow me. That's what a disciple is. This word disciple is literally a word that comes from the word discipline. It's a discipline. It's, it's an active saying, and it's hard. I'm not mastered it. It's hard. I've had to swallow things a lot of times I didn't want to swallow. It's a discipline. And the Lord will discipline those that he what? That he loves. That he loves. So we know that either we're going forward with God, the reality is, or we're going backwards. Now, don't raise your hand, but some of you can say, I'm going forward with God. And then some of you, really, you can just be honest with yourself. You know you're not going forward with God. That's a reality. I know everyone in this room is not going forward with God. That's just, there's no way. I know it. I know it. Because of fruit. What are you becoming? Judas Iscariot was an apostle who became a traitor. This man who had been used mightily of the Lord. Been used mightily of the Lord. Judas Iscariot, the traitor? Yep. To heal the sick. Judas? To raise the dead? Judas? Cleanse the lepers? Judas? Cast out demons? Judas? Why do you say that, Lee? Because... The word says it, Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Matthew 10, 8. <clears throat> These 12 Jesus sent forth, get this now, and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and go and preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Here's what he told them to do. He gave them authority to do this. In fact, he instructed them, this is what you're going to do. Jesus was telling them this. This is something that came down from Rome or whatever. This was the Lord Jesus saying. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. 
freely you've received, freely give. Judas knew the excitement and joy and power of personally walking with Jesus. How many understand that? He did. He saw miracles. He partook in miracles. Signs and wonders. He, was, he saw the, 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 the 5,000 and the 4,000 fed. He saw all of that. He saw the, 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 uh, the, the daughters raised, Jairus' daughter. I mean, he saw all kinds of miracles. And, you know, he walked with Jesus. And he was commanded, and, and no less. That word there tells me that these guys partook in these miracles. They were mighty men of God. Twelve chosen, personally chosen by Christ. How I many say that's awesome? And Judas Iscariot was right there in the midst of them. The one that sold Jesus Christ out for that silver. Betrayed Christ. Gave him over to the Roman authorities. That one there. Judas had a problem though. He had a serious character flaw. How many say he had a character flaw? He had a moral weakness. Scripture reveals that despite the fact that God was using Judas, John 12, 6 says Judas was a thief. Flat out. Judas was a thief. You know what Judas used to do? He'd steal from the, the box that the disciples had to carry around. You know, because the Lord could do a miracle. They could do anything. If they needed food, he could go create food. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. But, but you know, the Lord... He, he abided, our Jesus abided by the laws of the land. Remember, he even said, render unto Caesar what Caesar. In other words, taxes, yeah. He even had a tax collector as a disciple. <laughs> I mean, you know. I mean, so he walked by the ways of the, of the world. And they had some collection of things, that, you know, because he had to take care. How many know he had to eat? Had to stay somewhere. And Judas would pilfer the money box. It's significant to understand that, get this now, that Jesus allowed a thief to carry the money box. <laughs> Think about that for a second. The Lord Jesus, the Son of Glory, allowed a thief to keep up with the money to take care of them as he was here on earth. Because Jesus was fully God, but yet what? Fully man. Jesus got hungry. Jesus got tired. And they all did, we knew all the other guys did as well. Sometimes, now get this now, sometimes we think the Lord is going to challenge us on every issue. Can I say it again? Sometimes we think the Lord is going to challenge us on every issue. But there are times when his silence about our repeated sin is his rebuke. Oh boy. Well, he, he didn't say anything about... Uh, Jesus never, I, I, I just healed somebody this morning. And, uh, you know, I imagine it started, you know, it's, you don't never just fall off a cliff unless you're riding that horse past cab was talking about. <laughs> I still love that. <laughs> but it's usually when we begin to backslide, it's just a little bit at a time. You know? And sometimes we do this and then we come back. And then we do and then, Oh. 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 And then we slowly, slowly, slowly. See, Judas probably in a moment of weakness took, took a little something from the old box that one day. And, uh, you know, Jesus knows everything, right? Mm -hmm. And he'd say nothing to me. In fact, he didn't even know it was missing. <laughs> and then... Little by little, see, he had a problem with money. How many know he sold the Christ out for money? Jesus. And he'd take a little here and a little there. And, you know, he thought that Christ's silence on the whole issue meant that it was okay. In fact, I think he finally got to the point, he was like, God's all right with it. Hmm, I'm a mature Christian. I can do all these things. And you know what? I prayed for somebody today and they got healed. Oh, I did that and they got healed. You know, we're talking about personalities and revival. 
We've had our share of scandals, haven't we? In the American church. I mean, when I say the American church, I'm talking about the church in America. I mean, you know, I've heard of just awful things. Uh, just, I'm not even going you know, to repeat things. We know, we don't say the names. Some of them have repented and moved on. Praise God. How many know David was, a, was an adulterer and a murderer? But yet he had the heart of God. And yet we see things and we see people work and we see the blessing of God on them and, we, and yet they're in open sin. It's all right. It's okay. Everything is absolutely fine. And God's silence on them is his judgment. But yet the reality is we haven't been judged. Let's look here at Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read in verse 15. Matthew 7. It's talking about false prophets here. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are raven and wolves. You shall know them by what? Their fruits. You can tell if they're... Look and see what's happening in their life. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. That's a fact. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Whereby? Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. And now, the most solemn, the most fearful passage in the Bible, the scariest passage for anyone that sits in a pew, for anyone with a ministry gift, for anyone that is religious, for the Pope in Rome, Jesus said this, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many, now the word says many, it didn't say some, doesn't say a few. I got reading out of the King James here. Many will say to me, to Jesus, me is capitalized. In that day, folks, your day of judgment has not come yet. The silence in your life, the crickets that you hear, and you feel like, I can just do anything I want to do. Oh, God is good. He's so great. Oh, 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 oh. Let me have this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this, and this, this. We even got folks in the pulpit, ministries, million-dollar ministries. Give to me. Give to me, give to me. I, I, I'll pronounce a blessing on you. Just give to me. I'm doing it all. I've been in 50 years in ministry. God's blessed me. You see my jet out parked outside? I mean, if anybody's walking in that kind of goodness and glory and presence, you know what? He's got to be all right with God. Oh, he's all right. Guess what? He hadn't been judged yet. See, do you think the Lord knew what Judas was doing? I mean, come on. <laughs> he knew Judas. He chose him. He knew. And he gave him just enough rope. And he did, didn't he? Just enough. Here's what I fear for us. I fear for me. I preach this word. You know what? A lot of preachers preach stuff because stuff that touches their soul and their heart. You know, I mean, if it doesn't minister to me, how in the world is it going to minister to you? <laughs> I mean, you ever studied a message past the and said, oh, that didn't really do anything for me. You know what? I'm bringing that message on Sunday. No, it's for all of us. See, we haven't been judged yet. 
See, I'm not parked on a bench just waiting for the Lord Jesus to return. And if the falling away happens, well, I might have, might have to fall away. You know, either we're moving forwards or we're moving backwards. Let me say amen. And we don't want to stand before the Lord Jesus. Finish this here. Many will say to me in that day, in the day of judgment, hasn't happened yet. Jesus clearly saying right here, in that day, in that day. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about that day. In that day, Lord, Lord, we haven't, how many of you have prophesied in your name? How many of y'all have preached a message? Pro that's what prophesying is preaching, preaching the word, prophesying. Haven't we prophesied in your name? And, and in your name, we've even, we've had authority over the demons. We've cast them out too. And in your name done many wonderful works. This is scary stuff. And then I will profess unto them, <laughs> I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you work, you who work iniquity. Folks, what are we becoming? What are we becoming? Are we walking? I'm just talking to Joe Q. I hope no Joe's in here. Joe Q. Pewsetter this morning. I'm telling you, what are you becoming? What are you becoming? The word says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A relatively minor sin that we do not attend to can lead to a major sin that destroys our lives. The Bible says that Judas became a traitor. He started out in ministry loyal to Jesus. But then he began lying about the finances and his deceitful exterior completely hid a corrupt and darkened heart. Judas was a thief that became a traitor. Eventually taking his own life, his compromise with sin went from bad to worse and destroyed him. Uh, you know, we live, this is White Oak Worship Center. How many, ever, how many like these big white oak trees you see around here? On this mountain and all the place, beautiful. Pastor Cabell, how, long, how old do you think some of these trees are? Hundreds of years. Do you know all those big trees started with an acorn? <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm getting at. That all started with an acorn. Sometimes that little acorn, just a little thing, you know? How many say the little foxes? Little bitty, little fox. Little things. And we said, oh, 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 oh. And you know what? But, man, I hadn't been rebuked yet. Lord, Lord, hey, Lord. Wow, he even gave me a compliment today. Oh. <laughs> Before you know it, you're saying, you know, I can have that woman. I can look at this. I can do that. You know, I know that, not to be legalism, okay? I know that, you know, yeah, you can have a little drink here or there, but, you know, I take that there. It's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm mature. Take that. The next thing you know, you're a raging alcoholic. You knew better. You knew better. You knew. And there was a time in your heart where you wouldn't even have thought. I'll tell you, pastor has had, he's, He's had quite the history. Pastor Cabell is too. These men of God have been pastoring and preaching for years. And their stuff that would have happened in the 1970s, if that stuff had happened, if the stuff happening today would have happened in the 1970s, Lord. Oh my Lord. The stuff that we don't even blink at today. Or even, or even worse, a deacon congratulates it. Oh, that actually looks good. The word says we're supposed to run from the very appearance of evil. 
Judas became something that he didn't think he would ever think he would become. He, I'm chosen. I'm one, golly, I'm one of the 12. I am one of the 12. You think about that. You know, God knows, how many of you know this? God knows what's going on in the world. Injustice. War. All kinds of definitions of different things. Marriage. Profane speech. Every foul thing that has come into our world. What are we to do with it? Well, I don't know about you. It makes me mad. Now, does it make you mad? Now, I'll tell you what. If it doesn't make you mad, you ought to be the first one to the altar. In a moment. But it should make us mad. Now, God knows that it makes us mad. But you know what? We can't get mad at the world. Why in the world? Who's the God of this world? Satan, little G. Why would I get mad at a man that is just doing what his God has told him to do? Now, I do get mad at the church now. That's the ones that really make me mad. I, somebody that is never not born again, I don't get mad at them at all. I, I love them. I have mercy on them. Now, ones that's walking around saying they have Christ and they act like hell. And then, and then try to prove you that they can do whatever they want to do. That's, I mean, you know, they've erred from the truth. Somebody needs to go to them and turn them from them. They need to turn from their wicked ways. That's the truth, isn't it? I know that's hard, but God knows this. God's word tells us, be angry. Ephesians 4, 26, yet do not sin. Now, this is where we get it wrong in the church. I'm going to get ready to step up. Give you, I, got your boot, I got my boots on today. Is Jerry here? Jerry, I got, my, I got your boots on. Uh, <laughs> he gave them to me. He didn't think I was going to wear a pair of boots. And I wore them one Sunday. And I ain't never given back to him. I like them. And uh, Lord, forgive me. I asked. I said, I'll pay him for them. And he said, no, you can have them. I love you, Jerry. <laughs> We've got to, we, 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 we can be angry, but we, we don't need to sin. We must discern at what point anger degrades into sin. How many know, have you ever been angry enough that you've sinned? Come on. How many? We, everybody. Paul continues this. He says, do not let what? The sun go down on your anger. We can legitimately be angry about things that are truly wrong, and we should. When we see injustice in the world, when we see our senators parading around and saying these two men can do this and that, and then, and then have the audacity to come into a, a, a children's school and a drag queen come in and to read something, and that's okay. If I say something about it, then I'm the bigot. That makes me mad. Yeah, it should make you mad. Hey, I love the, I love the man dressed up in the in the women's clothes. But I don't want him going and educating my kids. He needs Jesus. That's just the bottom line. That's the bottom line. But what, how we express it is the key, is the church. I'm talking to the body of Christ. We can be angry, but the word clearly says we cannot allow it to cause sin to fester. And how we express it, we must take that indignation and find a more noble and redemptive attitude of expression. I don't mean that we need to, to, to put our heads in the sand. I mean, like an ostrich. We need to be knowing what's happening in this world. See, the reason we become passive is that's why we have drag queens going in and teaching kids in kindergarten. Because people have just said, well, I love you and... Yeah, we, I, felt, I love them too. But we haven't spoken up, right? It becomes passive indifference. I mean, we must rise to this aggressive intercession. This is what has to happen. Not aggressive, not aggressive conflict or going to board meetings and, you know, just ready to tear people's heads off. You know, and you might really have a point. I mean, it actually might really be something that really is frustrating. I get it. 
I get it. But there's a way. And then the world looks at it and says, aha, up, up, that's Christian. Look up, say, hey, see him? We've got to be careful. See, what we've done is we've allowed, what are we becoming? We've allowed the sin of anger to mellow over. We become angry and then we, I have sinned. And we feel justified in it, but we, we've not prayed about it. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? When somebody says, I hate the president. I'm, I'm, I think he's blah, 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 blah. Have you prayed for him? He, we're all under his, I mean, what he does can cause us. I mean, can you imagine if something goes wrong, we end up going to war with China. I got a son that's seven, uh, 16 years old. I don't want him going over to China in a couple years to fight. We're supposed to have, the word says we're supposed to pursue peace with all men. So we got to pray. We've got to pray for those that we disagree with. Not destroy them on Facebook. Okay, I'm talking to the church today. If you get mad at me, just you can get mad at me. I won't do what pastor does. No, I'm not going to do that. What did Jesus do when they were crucifying him and nailing him to the cross? The, the man that didn't do anything came to save them. He said what? Father, forgive them. He prayed for them. He prayed. To, that's a prayer. Jesus was praying to God. Father, forgive them. We think of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Remember Stephen? He was being stoned to death. And as he was being stoned, as he was being pummeled, he looked up into heaven and actually saw Christ stand up. The first martyr, and he didn't say, get these guys off of me, destroy them, send up hot nuclear heavenly missile. I mean, he said this. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Acts 760. Every time we face an injustice, may God give us a fresh revelation of Jesus that we not pray for judgment, but pray for mercy. Amen. Stephen's prayer for mercy caused grace to be released. You know why? Because there was a fellow there that was holding the coats that day. And he said, throw the big rock at him. I hate him. He's against Judaism and he's, he's against everything that we as a Pharisee stand for. Jesus ruined us. And we've got to, we've got to do everything we can to discredit anyone that would follow Christ. His name was Saul of Tarsus. But yet, a little while longer, grace was released to that guy. I think was a result of Stephen. Lord have mercy on him. And the apostle that wrote pretty much two-thirds of the New Testament. A lot of stuff I'm preaching out of is the same guy that was holding the cloaks of the people as they threw stones, hurled them at the first Christian martyr. The grace of God came to Saul, turned his name to Paul. He got saved on the road to Damascus. If we don't pray about it, what are we becoming? I'm just mad. I watch this news and this news, this guy makes me mad. Don't watch him anymore. <laughs> if he makes you mad, don't stop watching him. I, have you ever got, I get mad sometimes, you know, and I've gotten mad and, and I'm thinking, walking around the house and you know what the Holy Spirit told me one time? He said, so you want to kill him? Yeah, I was like, oh, I to get my hands around him. And the Holy Spirit, you want, to, you, want to, you want to kill him? You want to do that? I thought, Lord. And I had to say, I didn't say, so please forgive me. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I don't want to kill him. You know, and it's hard at times. It is hard. But what are you becoming? Are you letting prayer? You know, Jesus said, hey, if you smack you on one cheek, give them the benefit of smacking you on the other cheek. That's hard. Isn't it? Ooh, I hate. That's hard. Those are hard words. Love your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. What are we becoming? Judas mutated from an apostle doing miracles, miracles, into a double life. Our anger left unattended will do the same to us. It causes us to degenerate into something we never planned on becoming Christian Pharisees. 
You know what? We don't want to be Christian Pharisees. Today in America is overstocked with one thing, angry Christians. Angry Christians. I had a person show me a video, of, a, of a, and I'm not going to say the name. Don't even ask me, because I'm not, of an individual that was preaching. And he was preaching, and he was just, and he was, he started getting over into politics and stuff. That's one reason we just kind of stay away from it. Everybody has a political opinion, okay? I just preach Jesus. If you get mad at me about Jesus, so be it. If you persecute me because of Jesus, then that's my reward. But if you get mad at me because I'm a member of a political party or something, then you know what? Shame on me. <laughs> I'm going to get it full barrel. This guy was just preaching, and he went into preaching, gone into meddling. And then he, something come over him. It was demonic, really. And he told everyone that was of a different political party to get out. He told them to get out. How many of you know that ain't the heart of Christ? <laughs> no kidding. That's division. How many know we're supposed to be reconcilers? Just as Christ has reconciled us, we're to reconcile others. What did that guy become? I'm not saying, I, hopefully he's took care of it. But in that moment, which was a dark moment for him, he was more invested in something else than he was the gospel. How many know that God is no respecter of person? That's when, you know what, if people come in and the, if people come in and we disagree with them, how many know we love them? We love them. Now, I'll tell you the truth from the gospel. I won't put no R or D beside of it. I'll just tell you the truth and you can do, you do with it what you want to do with it. What are we becoming? What are we becoming as a church? What are we becoming? And I'm talking about as a nation. Angry, bitter, ready for fighting. But that's not what Jesus has in mind for his church. He's coming after a church without what? Spot or wrinkle or blemish. See, don't dismiss your anger as a little sin. It disqualified Moses from going in to the promise. Moses, the man that had put up with them, bickering and complaining, one day, Lord said, speak to the rock. And he got mad and he just hit it. That's what he did. I mean, wouldn't you want to hit the rock? I mean, after you have been meeting with God, the creator of the universe, <laughs> and every time you come back to these people, they're crazy. They're doing stuff, putting golden calves are coming out of the fire. I mean, you spend, you know, it's like, what in the world? God, these are your people. You can see how that happened. I don't, I don't, man, Moses is awesome in my sight, in my mind. And he did that, and, and yet that disqualified him. Think about the things that when we get mad, think about the things that we say at times. We're not Moses, but yet God is watching. You see, there are things at stake that are bigger than our indignation about right and wrong. Although we should be concerned about what's right and wrong. The world is watching how we relate to those who are morally wrong, the church, even when we are biblically right. Amen? And they are watching to see if we sound like the Savior or the Pharisees. You see, there's one thing that's more crucial than how the world sees us. It's important. But it's how Christ Jesus sees us. He is watching and what is happening in our hearts. He asked this simple question. Do you know what you are becoming? Because you're becoming something. You're not a finished product yet. Yeah, you got a spirit and soul and body. Reverend Billy Graham, his wife, Ruth Graham, you go down to her, uh, they're both buried down in Charlotte at the museum. And she always talked about how she was a work in progress. And on her tombstone, it says something to this, that construction is complete. It's not verbatim, but to that, to that effect that she's a finished work. 
she's standing before the presence of the Lord. See, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, when Jesus said, in that day, where are you? You're not a finished product today. I don't care how much you want to be a finished product. And you want to sit on the pew. And you want to just rest until Christ comes. We're to be busy about his business. 1 John chapter 2, 6 says this. It says, whosoever says he abides in him, in Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Amen. Would you bow your head? Lord, I thank you today. This is a tough word. And Lord, it's a word that strikes me because, Lord, I see areas in my life that, Lord, I, quite frankly, I failed. I failed the test at times. I've had to go around and around because I haven't treated people the way I should treat them. You would want me to treat them. I haven't reacted that way, God. And Lord, we know that we're not perfect. We are forgiven. Lord, I'm not a finished work. Lord, the day you call me home is the day that I'll stand before you. Lord, I want to be in your presence. God, I don't want to be associated with a, that one apostle that became a traitor. Lord, we don't want to become anything like that. And Lord, we know, Lord, today that either we're moving forward with you or we're sliding backwards. Lord, we just know that that's just the facts of the reality. It's not convenient. It's not something that we want to think about. But if we can think about a time in our life where we were living closer to you than we are today, then we are in a backslidden state. And God, you want to pour out revival. And I do believe that these are the embers of revival in this country. But it's not just about emotion. It's not about singing. It's not about praise and worship. It's about you. And it's about in our way, humbly seeking you, humbly coming to you and humbly turning from our wicked ways. In the name of Jesus, I pray. If there's anyone here today, first and foremost, you don't know Jesus today. You say, Lee, I, maybe you have known Jesus at some point, but you just feel like there's sin in your life that's keeping you from moving forward and you would ask for me to pray for you today I would be love to do that not to embarrass you we don't do that we don't go out and embarrass people that's nothing that's nothing important about anybody getting embarrassed and God's not interested in embarrassing you not it not the least but he is interested in your heart he is interested in you walking pure before him in honesty in a relationship that's open the reality is he sees everything Perhaps he hasn't been speaking to you and you feel like you've just been able to do what you want to do, but today, God is speaking right now. While I'm speaking right now, God is speaking. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And he's gently telling you, you need to make it right. If there's anybody here today, if you'd lift your hand, anyone here, say, Lee, I'd like you to pray with me. Anybody. 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 I do feel like that this message is for the church. And I don't feel like it's a message that you know your heart. It's not something, I'm not your priest anyway. Jesus is. But I think it is a message today where I think that we as a church need to make up our minds today. That we want to become more like you. Pastor Rogers, not the litmus test. Some religious leader that we love and honor and respect, fine men and women of God, are not the litmus test. The litmus test is Jesus. And Lord, help us. Help us today to react to things that are troubling. But let us react in a redemptive manner to love people. Not to accept sin, no. But to love them and to minister mercy and say, our prayer is God. Not for you to judge them, but our prayer is that you deliver mercy for them. Mercy for our nation, God. We pray that right now. 
We pray for mercy for our community, God. Lord, mercy for everyone in here. Lord, I want your mercy. Lord, when I messed up, God, I need your mercy and grace to come. Would you stand up with me today? We're going to go, and I just really believe that we're going to, I want to pray a corporate prayer today. I really feel this, and I felt this for the church, because it is a message for the church about repentance, about where we are. And it's a personal message. It's a message that you can take home with you, and you can, hey, you can examine yourself. Paul said, examine yourself. That you be of faith. Hey, check yourselves out. I check myself just like you would in a mirror every day before you walk out there. You make sure your hair is combed. You got your clothes on right. You don't have two left shoes on. And you walk out. Just as that way, the Word of God is our spiritual mirror as we can see clearly what we look like today. And I'm telling you, the church today as a whole, and I'm not talking about just here, I'm talking about the body of Christ I can't comment on the body of Christ in Spain or Morocco or wherever, but I can comment on the body of Christ in America. And it's, it's sad right now. So let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just touch. Come on and pray with me this morning. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would just touch, Lord, this generation, God, today. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would make our minds up today, Lord, as the body of Christ today, as the people of God. Lord, that we want to experience revival. We want to experience an outpouring of God. But first, it must come humility. First, it must come, Lord, that we seek you out in prayer. First, it must come out, God, Lord, that we, Lord, turn from our wicked ways, God. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that you will then hear from heaven, God. Lord, you'll hear our cries, God. It's sincerity, Jesus, and you'll not only forgive our sins, but you'll heal our land. God, we need a healing in this land. Lord, we pray, God, that the embers of revival, Lord, would just burn bright, God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you would just touch this church, God, that it would be in a spirit of revival, God. Lord, not, not, to, not for a, a bunch of emotions, but God, for a still sovereign move of you. Could be emotional, but God, that when people walk out the doors of the church they're as, as set on you on Monday as they are on you on Sunday God that they want to live and be a light in darkness God Lord that there would be change that would happen in our culture that Hollywood's business would just dry up in the name of Jesus Lord we just know today that we are in the midst of a falling away but Lord let us be that remnant bright and true and clear today following you at every step of the way I pray that for every person here today God Lord I know Lord we didn't have any hands lifted up but I know Lord that there's many in here that are struggling today it doesn't matter whether they lift their hand or not I pray Lord right now in Jesus name you touch them you know who you are receive that in Jesus name receive that in Jesus name if you need to ask for forgiveness right now ask him for forgiveness Bow your head, whatever you got to do. Ask Him for forgiveness and say, Lord, I need you today. I want more and more and more of you, God. Help me today. I'm tired of living the way I've been living, trying to have one foot in the world and one foot in church. I can't do it anymore. I pray that today. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen, amen. I love you this morning. Hope I didn't step on too many toes, but I just see the churches. You know what? Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church.